<laughs> so uh, I'm happy Linux. to finally introduce to you, uh, if this is at all needed, Richard Hartmann from SpaceNet. And without further ado, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for coming, even though there was alcohol yesterday night. Um, I can probably spare myself this one. Um, somewhat relevant what I did the last few years. Um, the main pit of this is um, that I really have been on call for about seven years without pause. So I have a lot of opinion about monitoring simply because else I would be insane by now. Uh, I used to use Cebex exclusively in the past. Um, that's done with. And I really, really like monitoring, but I hate almost all monitoring tools because they suck and they don't reduce your work. The only really relevant part on this slide for this talk is um, that we do have a lot of old systems at SpaceNet which predate pretty much everything else. Uh, and they're good enough so there's not a lot of need to change them, but there is still a need. Uh, you probably know this from your companies. Um, we do a lot of just carpet bombing style email alerts. They are getting less and less, but still they are there. There's a lot of islands of data where teams just have their own monitoring or their own data management or whatever. And these things don't talk to each other. And that's a bad thing. Okay, so that's the other version. Uh, quick show of hands. Who has heard of Prometheus? Who is using Prometheus? Who is using Prometheus in a POC? Who is considering to use it? And who's not considering to use it? <laughs> okay, so a uh, quick intro. Uh, Prometheus was born by a few people from Google leaving Google and seeing that there is nothing really valuable on the market. Um, there is OpenTSDB, but OpenTSDB is quite complex, so they decided to do it just anew. It is a time series database, so you can basically only store uh, values which go forward in time, nothing else. Um, the data model is extremely simple. You basically have labels which determine the name and, and the instance of a time series. And other than that, you just have tuples of float64 timestamp, float64 value, nothing else, which makes a lot of code quite easy and fast. Um, it's geared towards either instrumenting your code as in having real functions which increase counters when there is a HTTP 200 or whatever, or to have exporters which basically pull outside monitoring or outside whatever state into Prometheus. Um, it's not made for event logging. If you need event logging, and you probably do, you want mtail, elk stack, whatever, use something else, not Prometheus. And dashboarding has been officially uh, killed off in favor of Grafana because Grafana is just better. And so both projects can focus on what they do well. Yeah. The main selling points of Prometheus are the main, well, the single thing which is pro we are probably not used to is service discovery is built in from the start. So you've got DNS-based service discovery, you've got Kubernetes exporters, you've got file-based uh, importers. Doesn't matter, there is half a dozen or a dozen different service discovery mechanisms which can exist in parallel. So you have, even if you have highly dynamic uh, systems where, for example, Planet24 spins up their, their Docker containers every 15 minutes, for reasons, um, they still have proper monitoring because it's just that dynamic. There is no hier hierarchical model, so you don't have data center, floor, whatever, cabinet, server, CPU, core, um, temperature. It's all without inherent or without built-in uh, model. You just apply labels, and by applying those labels, you basically build an n-dimensional matrix, which you can slice and dice whichever way you want. So it's quite easy to do a summary by data center, by customer, by whatever, by, by production versus staging. These things become really, really easy because you're not having an artificial system into which you press your, your data. PromQL itself is somewhat similar to R, uh, as in it does vector math, it does it really well, it is Turing complete, and it's used for pretty much everything. So if you do, for example, drill down, you will use exactly the same language for generating your graphs, even for generating your alerts. Basically, you have a query. If this query returns anything, that's an alert. So you can even have exactly the same query outside of your alert manager and just have cross-checks what would return as an alert etcpp without having to, to really uh, 
switch between different modes of thinking. Simple operation, um, it's one Go binary, you install it, you're done. Uh, it's really quite that simple. Um, you don't need, as with OpenTSDB or Borgmon, a huge cluster behind it which has half a dozen of services which you depend on. This is by design because when something breaks, as we all know, the networks break first. Um, when you've got a cluster, you don't have monitoring anymore. Congratulations. And it's highly efficient. How efficient? This is a real number. Um, Björn was bored and he just tried to see and try and see how many samples he could get in a random machine on a weekend. And he left this running for quite some time, so this is sustained ingestion and a working system at more than half a million samples per second with a relatively small machine. So now you're saying, yeah, I've got two float 64, that's 16 bytes, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of data. No, it's not, because um, they are doing delta of delta encoding, where you basically, you don't have the value which you store, you store one value, then you take the delta to the next value, then you take the delta of, the next, of this delta, and you store this in a certain quite genius way, uh, depending on how the data structure looks. Uh, so, for example, you return one a few times, you don't have to store any data anymore because the delta of one to one is already zero. That's quite nice. And the total average of a, a, across billions of machines is 1.28 bytes. Not bits, but bytes. Um, so you can see you get a large reduction in your number of, uh, of storage. And of course, if you have cheap ingestion and if you have cheap storage, you can get just gather more data, which helps you get more insight. <coughs> to look at the exposition format, I talked about labels. These are the labels. You can do whatever you want. You can put whatever you want in them. This is all just a special version of a label. It's underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. Um, else it's internally just the same. So they reuse a quite a bit of code just to make it the code pass more efficient. And then at the end, you just tack on a number, which in this case are integers, but they could be float 64. Um, to look at the language, how you get things out, this is PromQL, this is SQL, PromQL, SQL. Um, you probably don't do a lot of SQL on your current monitoring, um, but I have to have some comparison, and that's the easiest thing to do. As you can see here, obviously, Within SQL, you have to, if you have, let's say, a dozen labels, you have to specify those to get exactly what you want. And if someone comes and adds a 13th label, uh, all of a sudden you have to redo all your queries because else things break. Here it's different. You basically tell Prometheus what you care about. You can also say without to tell it what you do not care about. And everything else is just done by magic without you having to do anything. Basically, it ex ex expands all these subqueries, sees if the result sets match in number, and if there is a one-to-one -one match, which it can do programmatically. And if yes, and in most cases, that's a yes, it just does whatever you want. So with this query, you could, in theory, have 20k time series over a whole week and you grab it with just that one thing, and it does exactly what you want. It's extremely, insanely powerful. So, to get to Grafana, and I'm sorry, I don't have any screenshots, but you can just look it up on the internet. <laughs> um, Grafana has dozens of different data sources. So, for example, if you have a running graphite, if you have a running Cebix, if you have a running anything, you can probably get this into uh, Grafana. So, you have one dashboard for different data sources and you can show it all at once. You can even compare ARMA queries the same to compare the graphs or to have half of the old system and half of the new system together. It has a quite modern UI, as pro most of you probably know. Um, it allows for quite some complex data manipulation, and this is getting better and better all the time. So you can do really interesting things with the raw data which you have. It does have native Prometheus support. Prometheus is actually the largest growing uh, backend for uh, Grafana, which is why they kind of focus on it next to Graphite. And if you do anything in the dashboards, clear your cache often, because there are a dozen bugs in Grafana. <laughs> I see people nodding, <laughs> which basically mean that you are half caching something and you get weird state. So if you do edits in Grafana, just clear your cache and hopefully at some point it'll get better. 
just as a rough timeline, um, so for DEPCON 15 in August last year, uh, we did this all with LibreNMS, and that this ran quite well. Uh, I wanted to do the same both for SpaceNet and for for FOSDEM. I told the FOSDEM team as much. Um, someone working at Google suggested I should look at Prometheus instead. And next day I had a POC running. It's just that simple. It's really just that simple. Yeah, and this FOSDEM has been working with Prometheus exclusively. Same as going forward. So something which uh, is sp somewhat specific within the Prometheus world, but it quit fits quite well into this audience, um, is the SNMP support of Prometheus. Because I suspect most of you has a, have SNMP devices at, at some point in your network. Um, we are currently the largest user worldwide of SNMP exporter, which will probably change at some point in the near future. Um, but we had massive problems with the SNMP exporter. Just to get the nomenclature right, exporter is basically something, again, which pulls into or which exposes in a format which Prometheus understands. So it's a translation mechanism between SNMP and, and Prometheus. And we had a lot of issues with this system. Um, system load went up to 11 and higher. Um, we had several devices which just flapped and they went away, they came back, it was it set. A stable set of devices, we never figured out why, it just was weird. Um, but basically we just decided to uh, hand some money to one of the Prometheus guys. On purpose not doing it ourselves, because we wanted to be this within all the patterns of Prometheus. Uh, and he just wrote it new in Go. There are some issues with it, because a lot of devices return crap by SNMP. And if you repeat data structures, if you have duplicate key entries, if you miss some key entries, um, the internal error checking of the Go library of, S uh, of Prometheus becomes quite unhappy and errors out. This is on purpose to force people to have clean data structures. In this regard, or in this specific case, it's quite a problem for us, because we can't just magic devices to be better. We can complain to vendors and they can fix it, but it'll take time. So what we do, we just use the Python exporters for the small subset of maybe two dozen devices. If you use the um, either of these, um, INET address is broken in the Python SNMP exporter implementation. So if you need to use INET address lookups in the Python version, you need to fix it and push it upstream. And iOS XR is quite weird when it comes to some hardware values. And there is no clean way to map these in SNMP exporter yet. And of course, some devices die when you pull them too often. And that's basically it from the Prometheus side, because it's really easy, it's really quick. If you try it and you see it, you'll like it, I promise. Um, and that's it. But I realized, as someone who was at the same company for 11 years and did things in a certain, I would dare say, quite efficient way, coming to a new, different company who's been around for decades, which also does things in their own efficient way, um, there was some culture clash in a, in a few places. And for me, this was quite the learning experience and almost the more important thing about this talk, which is why it takes up quite a bit of space. And I suspect you'll agree after I'm done with this. So the biggest problem was not the technical part. The biggest problem I faced was of the social kind. Because people resist change. You often have incentives, uh, incentives which run counter to change. You have SLAs or SLOs which you need to keep, and they are mostly defined in, in a wider high way, especially in the networking community, which means change is risk, change is hard, and unless your processes, unless your people, unless everyone in the organization, even down to accounting and everyone, embraces a certain range, rate of change and realizes that change is just part of the whole system, uh, they will resent it. So the problem which is on top of that, if you introduce a new system, there's more work for people because all of a sudden they have to maintain two systems, they have to learn a new system and the old work doesn't just go away. Especially in, in critical applications like monitoring, due diligence means you have, you have to run them two at the same time. The old system, the new system and the new system needs to be shaken out for a month or even a year to see does this really work, does it alert on the same things because else 
If you lose money, uh, you lose all buy-in. So one thing to get easy and quick buy-in is that you show that you reduce toil. Toil is basically all this manual work which repeats, which has no value. You just have to do it. And if you have 10 machines, you have 10 amounts of work. And if you have 100 machines or 100 services, it scales approximately linearly. This is the prime target to reduce and to eliminate in your, in your daily work, because this gives the most benefit. And if the teams are always busy firefighting, they will never have the time to really sit down and engineer and do things the proper way. Most of us know this feeling. <laughs> um, so having quick wins, striving for immediate benefits, this will help you get people excited for this product. Not only that it's good and better, but only that it, at, at a very early point, reduces their toil, reduces their work. Um, Something on monitoring in and as of itself, which ties into this whole reducing toil, because useless alerts are also a quite evil or toxic aspect of toil. If it's not actionable, if I don't know by being paged, okay, I need to do X, it's not an alert, so I will not alert in it. I will not call someone in the night and say, fix this, because there is nothing to fix. Yes, this night says it's broken, but if I don't know what to do, it's not an alert. If it's not urgent, it's not an alert. 95% this way, who cares? If I know it'll not run out in the next 24 hours, who cares? Do it on the next day. If it's important, of course, do it. Do it in, in near time, because else it will become an alert. But if you predict your usage, and Prometheus helps you quite well in predicting usage, um, just do it during business hours. There is no need to do it at 3 in the morning on a Sunday. If there is no playbook, it doesn't go in production, which if you have the okay for management is quite nice for the people who are actually on call because all of a sudden the incentive for the people who, who write the stuff or create it have an incentive to, to create playbooks. And of course, if you don't know what to alert it and what your SLOs are, it doesn't go into production. One thing which helped at SpaceNet um, was one mail server incident. One of us... Um, set the wrong flag, mail server started accepting outside mail, spammers realized this within probably 30 seconds, did a really slow, clean, staggered ramp up to see how much load the system could take, realized, okay, this is quite a large and beefy machine, and then they went all in. Um, with the system we had and with the machine, which was actually affected, um, on call afterwards told me that they took less than 30 seconds to find this, uh, the problem with Prometheus and Grafana, where they would have taken at least, at least 60 minutes to find it elsewhere. Because this was a system which we didn't even think about of as having mail, and so it wasn't in the mail monitoring. But as it's so cheap to just toss everything in, we just did and we saw it, else we wouldn't have seen it. And all of a sudden, a few people realized, hmm, this saves work. This gets me sleep. I like it. But this is only for, for the people who are do doing operations. And everyone has their own view of the world. And without basically giving them what they want, playing to their intrinsic motivation of what they care about, you will not get buy-in from them. Because their motivation is not your motivation. That sounds buzzwordy, but it's true. A manager will care about the revenue. He will care about that whatever process is defined, it's executed well. He doesn't so much care about how it's defined, that's the architect's thing, um, but as long as it's defined, it should be followed, period. Service owners obviously care about powerful dashboards. Um, one of our product owners uh, recently got data out of, out of usage to calculate prices within minutes, which before took him hours with Excel sheets and everything. And so it was just one single query, and he knew the average uh, disk space usage of all our mail products, just for baseline pricing. This was So you have product managers, which all of a sudden are excited about monitoring. Team leads, yes, they care about their teams being happy. And the team members, they care about sleep. Mainly. <laughs> Say hi from me. No worries. Um, so long story short, um, tell everyone what they need to hear, what they like to hear, but never ever lie. Be open about what you tell them and why you tell them, but never ever lie. But do show them the big picture and what they care about of the big picture. Andersrum. Okay, kann ich nicht lesen, aber danke. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so basically, you have the old big picture. And you put it on the wall, either as actual picture or just something you agree on. And when you have buy-in, and when people care about what they see in this picture, about their little world within the large picture, they don't even have to ask you anymore. You don't even have to be around. You can be on holiday or you can leave or whatever. As long as they all agree on this big picture, every little decision which they make, go, do I go left or right here, if they align it with this vision of the big picture where they want to go, all of a sudden, all of the company slowly moves in the same direction. And there's a lot of little decisions which you don't even see or know or care about which help you reach your own goals as long as people agree and just do what they want and it aligns with what you want. So one thing which, or the main thing which in the end helped with, with all the non-technical parts in the company to, to make them excited about Prometheus is the leverage thing. Because if you have one system, you can all of a sudden correlate weird data with each other. For example, we have all our data center power feeds in there. And then we can actually show someone, okay, this is the power usage when you launch your new shop. And they have a tangible feeling of what really happens in the world. It might not even be that useful going forward, but still people have a better concept of what happens outside of their own small bubble of, of your company. And if you have this one source of truth, you also have a lot of things which all of a sudden become a lot easier. If you have one source of truth and everyone agrees on their view of the world, you don't have two teams arguing because their data is different from your data. If the data is bad, obviously you have to fix it, but who's at fault? If you have one system and everyone has a very high interest to, to get really clean data into that one system, everyone else benefits from this. So. If you've got 10, diff 10 different views, they all agree on the, on the basis. Um, you can have dashboards for drill down, down to the last bits and pieces, because you don't have to jump between those islands of data or log into a different tool or do whatever. Because this costs time and someone is an expert here and someone has been an expert there, and if one of them is sick, yeah, shit. Um, Auto-generated PDFs for customers, they look exactly the same as they look in the web interface for your customers, as for your service managers, as for your technicians, and it just falls out of Jenkins at the end of each month and people are happy about not having to do anything manually. And these, these reports also allow you to just do a general across whole the, com uh, the whole company, how are we doing in service X? And then you can give sales a sheet where they actually have a printout or PDF or whatever, and they can show to new or prospective customers, okay, this is how good we are. We never breached a single SLO during the last quarter, half year, year, whatever, in this respect or in this area. We breached one here and here, but we are still uh, in our total SLAs. SLA, SLO difference? No? SLI is basically what you aim for, SLO is what you, what you internally or what you commit to, and SLA is what you, what you actually pay damages for if you, if you breach them. Um, and then sales can show, uh, can show the customers, okay, we are really this good across the whole company. And this gains you quite some benefit with new or existing customers. Well, and of course, accounting is happy because they've got quicker exports for all whatever their data usage, accounting, and whatever is. So as monitoring is really, really central to what you do in the whole operation, if you choose one tool, you should choose it extremely well because you can benefit in a lot of places. We are not done yet. We still have many little different islands of, uh, of configuration data. This needs to be merged in one single CMDB. Um, we are not there yet with orchestration. We have a lot of old and working tools, but they are not as modern as they should be. And obviously, a lot of money comes out of those old things, so finding the balance of when to switch over is quite tricky because customers need to agree with what you want to do, at least when it's customer-facing. Adopting error budgets, where basically the people who develop something have the same error budget as the people who operate it. So if things break very often, normally the developers don't care because they don't get called out in the night. 
but it's all of a sudden they can't ship new features anymore because the error budget for this quarter is out and they don't get a bonus because they don't ship any new features, they start to really care about their error budget. That's a quite nice feature of this. And of course, if anyone is in Munich or wants to be in Munich, you can talk to me. Thank you. Questions? So, thank you for the talk. And do we have questions? Hi, uh, Jan Charmax is it, Nick? Uh, have you also considered using, or probably not, uh, but can you compare uh, your use case of Prometheus with InfluxDB? I didn't use InfluxDB. Uh, I talked to people who used it, uh, and the general consensus is that it's better. That's the short version. But I haven't used it personally. Over there? Oh, okay. There is one more question. Uh, you have shown us that the Prometheus has got a very high sampling rate, which is good. Um, but is there some kind of um, measurement or something like this? And um, Prometheus uh, gets, because of latency, very low rates of uh, measurements? You mean that Prometheus itself needs to pace itself so it doesn't over overload, or what do you mean? No, for example, when you do something like um, uh, requests only uh, um, once per minute, it's obviously for okay. a lot of... Um, so you're free to basically do whatever you want in polling intervals with three, between one millisecond and five minutes. This is what you should stay win, uh, within. You can also do daily or whatever, but then you get weird effects with, with um, basically time series being becoming stale because after five minutes they're considered to be stale. Um, this 15 seconds is just an example. We have machines which we poll every 10 seconds. We have machines which we poll every two minutes. And if you have, for example, long-running jobs or batch jobs, uh, there is a push gateway, which is basically just a HTTP proxy, which you push data into in text, or in text format, and then it shoves stuff back into Prometheus as soon as uh, Prometheus comes along and wants to have data. And whatever is current at that point in time uh, gets scraped. But you can do 10 different machines, 10 different scrape times. Thomas from uh, EWE, hi. Um, ich habe zwei Fragen, oh, I've got two questions. Um, can you explain a little bit the service discovery? Is that uh, the, like the SABIX way? You define an IP subnet, it scans the subnet for services like that and adds it mm -hmm. automatically? Is it the, the same way? No. Um, service discovery in the Prometheus way is you give a predefined list of services. Um, you can do this by text file, you can do it by, for example, DNS, which is, for example, what Google does internally. Um, you can have your, if you've got a Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes had na has native Prometheus support. Um, so it exports all its, its pods into Prometheus and Prometheus can just grab them and do monitoring. But basically you have a predefined list of stuff which you want to monitor and you get that into Prometheus. It doesn't do Auto discovery, it does service discovery. So it doesn't do it all by itself. You have to have a pre digested list. Okay. Um, second question um, Is there any way to, to make a decentral monitoring, like probe based or with a proxy or something like that? Yes. You basically just take more than one Prometheus. Um, you can set them up in a way where they don't even have local storage and just act, act as a caching proxy, more or less. Um, you can have, if you want HA, you can just put two beside each other. The normal model of working is if you have very large problem domains, uh, you will probably would have two for, let's say, email, two for service, two for whatever, per site. You have two on top of those service-specific ones, and then on top of that you have the global ones. But this is way more than, than most of us will need. And at each stage you can choose what the upper upper. Uh, Prometheus scrapes from the lower one and Prometheus is also able to take data, do continuous evaluation of the data and create new time series from the data which it ingested. So basically you do pre-computation on a lot of levels so you you compress the data as more as you more uh, the more you move upwards in your in your tree of Prometheus. And if you need drill down you just go back down and they have more and more detailed information. 
Okay, thank you very much. No worries. Okay, so let's thank our speaker. Thank you.